thank uh, IVU Med and um, you know thank uh, my colleagues in um, Uganda for the opportunity just to discuss things. Um, and really what I wanted to talk about was uh, bladder cancer management and really the whole point and one of the things why I, I really love working with IVU Med is uh, the real focus um, on you know not so much you know the the, the but, or basically on especially on the education but more the collaboration um, really with all of these things and especially all of us here as surgeons we're pretty you know in my experience is going to different countries and here is actually a photo that um, was taken of me here with Dr. Jay Smith when we were doing an IVU med trip in Mongolia. Um, this, you know, through all the journeys, like we've, you know, I have found um, really excellent surgeons and excellent doctors in so many different parts of the world. I and mean, it's not so much that, um, you know, the, the expertise or anything that we would teach, but different things that we can really learn from each other in terms of the experiences, how we manage things, how, you know, we, we can best do things. So um, because it's a smaller group, um, you know, I, I do want to encourage everybody, if you can, um, to, you know, use the uh, chat bot option or sorry, the, the chat here. I don't know if everybody can see that. Um, if you have specific questions that I could answer for you. Um, and then uh, because it's a smaller group, I, I, I do encourage you to keep this as a pretty open forum. So any questions that you might have, please let me know um, uh, or anything that you might want me to focus on. Um, you know, I'd be, I'd be uh, you, know, you know, I'd love to, you know, learn from you and also, you know, share what, you know, we know and what we've been doing research on. So I don't really have any disclosures or conflicts of interest here. Uh, this is the general outline. Um, and this was an uh, advertisement that I found, um, I think on one of your outreaches. I don't know if any of you were personally involved in this, uh, but this is from the Mount Elgon Hospital, um, just for some screening. Uh, what I wanted to do for this back you know, outline or you know, kind of go over the goals of our discussion is talk briefly just about the bladder cancer background, and especially uh, with urothelial carcinoma that here I'll call UCB, urothelial carcinoma of the bladder. That's also the same thing as TCC, transitional cell carcinoma, um, and also squamous cell carcinoma, which we know is fairly endemic in a lot of the um, uh, countries in especially uh, sub-Saharan Africa uh, because of the schistosomiasis. Um, the other thing I wanted to go over was uh, really go over some of the details for non-invasive bladder cancer, for example, with transurethral resections of bladder tumors and uh, intravesical therapy options, and then get into some muscle, uh, muscle invasive options, specifically with chemotherapy and cystectomy and different diversions that you can use. Um, one thing that would be helpful for me, so uh, I personally have not traveled to Uganda uh, but I have, you know, uh, several of my uh, medical school scholar, uh, medical school uh, students were from Uganda. Um, I, I was wondering if um, one of my Uganda colleagues, can you um, describe for me, um, you know, either some of the questions that you might have that you might want me to specifically answer or to discuss, uh, or if you can go over briefly what, um, you know, uh, treatment options that you offer for your bladder cancer patients. Um, it would help me to you know, frame the discussion a little bit better if I know that um, you only see squamous cell carcinoma or you are seeing only urothelial carcinoma and want some discussions on DCG treatment or intravesical therapy. I don't know if anybody is uh, willing or wanting to uh, just share briefly. Uh, if not, um, I can go ahead and just kind of share what I have. Uh, hopefully it's of some you know, use for you, but you know, again, I, I, I do encourage everyone here, if you can, um, you know, please uh, ask me any questions, um, or even if you, you know, want to help me, 
uh, frame the discussion a little bit so that I know exactly how I can help, what we can offer for you, um, and what you know treatment options would be, or sorry, what discussion topics would be uh, most uh, pertinent or useful uh, for you. Um, you know, again, any information would be very, very helpful. So just brief discussion in terms of who I am. Um, so I uh, am an assistant professor of uh, urologic oncology at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I grew up in New York um, and uh, really I did not find medicine. I, I uh, was actually studied uh, literature um, in college or in university and you know didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated from university. So I ended up um, Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, Job, uh, for that uh, comment there. Um, so the, let's see, grew up in New York City um, and didn't find uh, a love or passion for medicine uh, until, uh, you know, I started working with uh, homeless uh, people in Philadelphia and also lived in the Haiti and Dominican Republic uh, developing HIV clinics. So it was really there that I developed a passion, one for service, but also for global health and understanding the importance of um, education um, and collaboration, both from a patient perspective, but also from uh, providers and collaborations with other surgeons. Uh, I did my residency training at uh, Wild Cornell and my fellowship training at Vanderbilt with Dr. Joseph Smith and also uh, Dr. Ch uh, Sam Chang and Dr. Penson, uh, both of whom have been very active um, and are leaders uh, in the uh, AUA uh, as well as the uh, Bladder Cancer Guideline Committee. Uh, my particular research focuses on uh, improving patient education um, by oh, using um, innovative tools such as using, you know, mobile phone devices to help improve education. Um, and so those are some of my interests. And those are just pictures of my children with Philadelphia in the background. So briefly, bladder cancer in the United States um, it is one that uh, I have come to really focus a lot of my research and patient education uh, focus on because it's extremely morbid and has a lot of complications and it's extremely costly, both from a financial perspective, but also, uh, you know, strictly from a morbidity or patient's quality of life perspective. So bladder cancer is the most costly cancer to manage from diagnosis to death. Um, annually, it costs about $2 billion US, um, and uh, just for frame of reference, a radical cystectomy, the median amount uh, or median cost to the patient that's charged to the patient is about $42,000 US, which is about 156 million uh, Ugandan shillings. Uh, the majority of, urothelial, of bladder cancer are urothelial carcinoma of the bladder, again, TCC, um, with more than 90%. Uh, the, the rest of them are usually squamous cell, but mostly from uh, either recurrent urinary tract infections or from prolonged uh, Foley catheterization, with the majority of the 75 percenting as non-invasive, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. I will be using uh, some of these terminologies. So NMIVC is non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, and MIVC will be muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, for muscle invasive bladder cancer, cystectomy is a gold standard, but it is quite morbid with a more than 60% complication rate and a 43% readmission rate. So again, even though these are things that we have, you know, we are taking care of in the States and we do have a lot of resources, uh, even here we are dealing with a, you know, a large amount of complications for that. Sorry, so I, I don't know if there's a question that somebody had or. Okay, if, if not, then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go on again. Uh, feel free to use the uh, chat messaging option that's at the top of the, the computer screen if you have direct questions that you want me to uh, answer. So cancer and specifically bladder cancer in Uganda it was actually very interesting to kind of go and do the research on this. So cancer, in general, in Uganda, it really accounts for about 40% of the premature deaths that are not related to infections or infectious diseases. 
So it's quite a large proportion of the premature deaths in Uganda are related to cancer. We are seeing that a lot nowadays um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. We're seeing an increasing amount of uh, cancer being formed and um, uh, having a significant impact on the quality of life um, of, uh, you know, of the population. Smoking overall still causes about 6% of these cancer deaths. And what the WHO, what they found uh, was that up to 50% of these deaths are preventable. And that more than 80% of the cancers in Uganda have a significant delay of diagnosis. And we know that that's really pertinent for what we see in um, uh, urology where prostate penile and bladder cancer do have significant morbidity if you're talking about um, you know, delays of diagnosis. And what we can see here are the top 10 uh, cancers uh, in Uganda. And what we can see here, cervical cancer definitely is, has the highest mortality rate and the highest incidence in Uganda, but also prostate cancer has a very high uh, mortality and penile cancer is a very high uh, incidence and also mortality, both of which are obviously uh, urologic uh, malignancies and cancers that we can take care of. Cancers in Africa, um, there, there's an extreme variation in um, the incidence of bladder cancer depending on where you are, what you're looking um, you know, for and at. Um, in general, Sub-Saharan Africa or also including North Africa and Egypt, uh, is really predominantly squamous cell carcinoma that's related to schistosomiasis. So about anywhere from 50 to 70% of all cases of bladder cancer have been related to schistosomiasis. However, urothelial uh, carcinoma or basically bladder cancer or the urothelial uh, version uh, histology is increasing um, and accounts for about anywhere from 9 to 40% in contemporary series. So for example, in uh, one larger uh, registry series uh, in Egypt over 10 years, they've seen a really dramatic shift in their uh, bladder cancer representation where it increased over those 10 years from 20% to 66%, uh, whereas squamous cell carcinoma related to schistosomiasis decreased from 70% to 25%. You have to take that with a grain of salt because we know that in Egypt, there was a very, very uh, large um, kind of population initiative population-based initiative to uh, improve treatment for schistosomiasis to help uh, decrease uh, uh, the endemic infection rates among children, but also amongst adults as well. So smoking in Uganda, um, so this is also information from the WHO. It was actually very interesting to look at. So about 10% of men above the age of 15 um, are smoking, and in women, it's actually uh, it's a pretty low rate compared to other uh, uh, Sub-Saharan African countries was only 1%. However, again, the impact of smoking is still very high, where about 4% of all the deaths are related to smoking. Um, so it still is something that uh, has significant burden um, of disease. And again, urothelial cell carcinoma of the bladder uh, has a very strong connection and correlation with uh, smoking use. Schistosomiasis, I know that uh, my colleagues here now Uganda are much more uh, experts um, on uh, schistosomiasis and squamous cell carcinoma uh, care than I am, but just to kind of briefly go over this, worldwide it is a pretty endemic problem. It infects and is endemic in about 70 countries worldwide. Um, the hematobia uh, 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 subclass infects about 112 million people worldwide and about 46% of the infected children are less than 14 years old. So again, it is quite an endemic problem. In Uganda itself, it's estimated that about 4 million are infected and about 55% of the population is at risk. This is where it's very interesting. So depending on which uh, kind of district or area uh, that you are within Uganda, the infection rates vary quite widely from about 2% to 92%. Uh, for example, in the Bonda uh, uh, kind of district, it's about 80% uh, infection rate for them. And obviously, you know, uh, you know, the fresh access to fresh water um, is one of the, the the big signs or symptoms or uh, that helps with um, the infection risk, especially with the access to Lake Victoria. When we're comparing squamous cell carcinoma and uh, urothelial carcinoma, uh, it, the, the, the 
the differences are pretty striking and drastic. And again, squamous cell carcinoma tends to show up in younger uh, patients, tends to show up as painful hematuria and necroteria with ulcerating masses. There are significant delays in diagnosis with about 90% already presenting with invasive disease. Um, and up to a third, almost a third of them are inoperable. Uh, because of these delays in diagnosis, the five-year survival is uh, definitely a little bit worse to anywhere from 50 to 75%. Compared to urothelial carcinoma, where in the states the median age is really in the 70s, um, the vast majority percent uh, as non-invasive. Um, and the five-year survival, even for muscle invasive disease, is above 90% uh, in um, historical, uh, historical series. And these are some classic examples of uh, the effects of squamous cell, carcin car squamous cell carcinoma, uh, where you do get the ulceration uh, or ulcerative lesions. And again, you can see, for example, in that radiograph, these linear calcifications, uh, for example, already in that um, flat uh, plate A, you can have obstructive symptoms, which you see in that IV pilogram. Um, and uh, these kind of large papillary masses, especially when you're uh, talking about how it invades and involves the fundus um, and kind of trigon of the bladder can cause some pretty severe uh, obstructive symptoms. So when we talk about, in general, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, again, this is, this is where I'm going to divert the talk a little bit and focus a little bit more on the urothelial cell com component. The squamous cell car carcinoma component, because there's so much late presentation there, um, and because so much of it, is in, um, it involves the kind of invasive or radical treatment for it, um, I'll save a lot of those for when we talk about more of the technical aspects of muscle invasive bladder cancer. For non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, most of this will focus on urothelial cell carcinoma of the bladder. And really there are several principles that are key marks of quality treatment, mostly uh, having an early cystoscopy and uh, avoiding delays of diagnosis, uh, having a quality transurethral resection of the bladder tumor where you are getting muscle in the specimen, um, having some type of intravesical therapy, um, and then you know, understanding the, the correct steps for the salvage options and possible early or timely cystectomy if there are uh, recurrent um, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So just to kind of go over briefly, um, the survival in general for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is really excellent, where the cancer-specific survival is up, almost up to 85% at 10 years. Uh, for low-grade and high-grade disease, there are higher recurrence rates that we do have to talk about, where the low-grade um, urothelial carcinoma has a 50% recurrence rate and about a 5% progression rate, whereas high-grade T1 disease, we're talking about a 70% recurrence rate and a 30 to 40% progression rate. So you do have to be careful and wary of that type of disease. The AUA, which I'll you know, speak to here, and again, um, we have to thank Dr. Chang for his leadership in this committee, but uh, the, the first thing that we always do with any type of bladder cancer, especially if it's urothelial, is, is to risk stratify because this helps to define um, our treatment strategy and the pre treatment paradigm that we have. So usually what we see is, and we try to split the, the, these bladder cancers into a low risk, middle risk, or intermediate risk and a high risk category. The low risk is pretty rare. We would have to be a pretty small, low grade solitary lesion. The intermediate risk could be a bigger solitary lesion or multifocal low grade disease or very small uh, high grade TA lesion. The high risk is basically everybody else, where if there's any other suspicious features or anything that's uh, more concerning, uh, where we you know, uh, would consider that to be a high, more of a high risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, and this is the algorithm that was uh, proposed and um, you know, it, it, it takes a while to kind of go through this. But again, once you risk stratify from the initial TRBT and separate them into the little, low risk, intermediate risk, and the high risk category, Really the low risk category, you're talking about um, doing the resection and then giving post-operative chemo such as gemcitabine or um, uh, mitomycin C, which is given intravesically. Uh, for the intermediate risk, uh, it's really talking about uh, doing induction chemotherapy or uh, a BCG treatment with maintenance for one year and then surveillance afterwards. 
And for the high risk, we're really talking about uh, doing a re-resection or re-TRBT with BCG and hopefully, if there's complete response, uh, maintenance for uh, three years. So for these guidelines, again, the, the, the having um, a high quality resection or high quality TURBT is very essential for the, the treatment of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So basically, uh, in your initial TRBT, even if there's high grade T1, especially if there's no muscle in that specimen, meaning it was not a high quality TURBT, when you do the re-TURBT, about 40 to 50% of those patients will actually be upstaged. Uh, so this is something very, very important to know about. And even if you have high-grade T1 and you do a re-TURBT, um, if there's a residual, there, uh, about 80% of those patients will um, progress to have higher risk features, and uh, about 15% of them will be upstaged. Uh, so it is important if you have your initial TRBT showing high-risk disease that you really strongly consider doing another resection to see if there's any residual disease there. So this is one of um, the kind of seminal uh, or, or one of the important um, articles that were that looked at this specific question where high-grade T patients who had high-grade T1 were then randomized to get uh, either a re-TUR or no um, second TUR. And we saw that there's a really significant difference in terms of the recurrence rate where people who got a repeat TURBT only had a 26% recurrence rate versus a no uh, repeat TURBT that had a 63% recurrence rate. So the question here that we often ask in the States is, should we be giving mitomycin C or intravesical chemotherapy post TURBT? And by and, by and large, the answer has been yes, that, the, that there is evidence and solid evidence that it does promote a, a, a dramatic decrease in uh, reduction in recurrence. So for mitomycin C, it's about a 30 to 40% reduction in the recurrence risk uh, if you give it um, uh, intravesically or in, uh, in, inside the bladder afterwards. And really the number needed to treat in order to prevent um, uh, progression is really only seven. It's a 13% absolute reduction in that risk, which is quite uh, dramatic. And this is kind of a, a forest plot or basically looking at uh, all the combinations of all the different studies and trials looking at this and, and summing the effect of uh, mitomycin or intravesical chemotherapy after uh, the TRBT resection. This is one of the newer studies. And so one of the important things and one of the things that I learned on my travels is that a lot of times mitomycin C or some or even uh, BCG may not be available. However, it seems that gemcitabine is much more uh, freely available. Um, so for example, in Vietnam, uh, we started a program where instead of using the BCG because they didn't have access to BCG or mitomycin, uh, did they, but they did have access to gemcitabine because it was used for other chemotherapy agents. So we were able to work it out with their, um, uh, their pharmacies to be able to start using uh, intravesical gemcitabine as part of a treatment for uh, bladder cancer. And uh, what the study importantly showed was that, again, you decrease the time to recurrence or the risk of recurrence with the use of a single dose gemcitabine after the TURBT or after the resection. And for this, uh, they had about a uh, one hour uh, dwell time. Uh, that's how long the gemcitabine stayed in the bladder after the resection. So in general, should we be giving intravesical chemotherapy after a TRBT? And the answer is yes. So mitomycin is effective. And uh, for those who have used it, it is quite toxic. And we are very concerned if there's any concern for a uh, bladder perforation uh, that you want to be careful with the use of mitomycin because it causes a really dense uh, fibrotic reaction that can cause a lot of uh, problems for the bladder and etc. later on. Um, gemcitabine is also a very good option and in fact we uh, here stateside are using it a lot more and a lot more frequently with very good results. <laughs> 
Um, so what I wanted to focus on here was uh, just the other part where we're going to look at more of the high risk uh, or intermediate risk and talk about, about uh, really the BCG treatment. And again, this was the uh, really seminal trial from the, the SWOG trial, Dr. Lamb, looking at the utilization where patients uh, with non-invasive bladder cancer were randomized uh, to BCG um, and really saw dramatic decrease in recurrence and progression rate. Uh, the one thing to note though is that um, of the patients that were enrolled uh, with the goal for you know, having quote unquote maintenance therapy for three years, really only 16% of the patients actually followed that. But for as long as you can follow it, it really does show a benefit for those patients. So again, now there are about four randomized clinical trials that showed level one evidence showing that BCG usage is uh, uh, effective in terms of re uh, decreasing recurrence risk, uh, which is a 40% relative decrease and progression, about 60% decrease uh, in the risk of progression um, uh, with it. So it is level one evidence uh, to use it. However, it still has significant toxicity uh, where 70% of people will have side effects and about 8% of people will have to stop. Um, and so uh, that's why we are, you know, uh, again, looking at different options for how to mitigate um, the side effects with BCG and also trialing other uh, options for them. Um, I'll kind of stop here for that. So I, I wanted to stop here for the non-invasive bladder cancer portion. And before I go into the more muscle invasive portion, uh, are there any questions or comments from uh, my Ugandan colleagues? Okay, if not, then we can uh, kind of carry on with this. So muscle invasive bladder cancer, again, these, uh, the staging system and these survival curves are really um, number one historical data, but also two uh, represent urothelial carcinoma of the bladder. They do not represent squamous cell carcinoma. But again, we can see that uh, with each increasing stage that there are uh, you know, a downward, um, you know, decrease in terms of the five-year survival risk. So this is kind of an example of a patient that we would normally see who would be at risk for uh, bladder cancer, uh, where he has a significant smoking history um, for about 30 years, presented with gross hematuria, and on TRBT was found to have muscle invasive features. And again, you can see here on his CAT scan, uh, where in his bladder, he does have this uh, invasive disease with fast stranding around it um, and hydronephrosis on the right side, which we know is an independent predictor um, and associated with um, uh, worse prognosis or more advanced disease. So he did not have any uh, signs of metastasis there. So of all these options, uh, you know, which one would uh, people recommend here. Um, and so if we just go ahead and kind of go, uh, so it would be choice C. So the gold standard and the best evidence for this is really the utilization of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, which is defined as chemotherapy before kind of the definitive surgery. Um, and with either uh, what we we'll call dose dens MVAC, uh, which is type of chemotherapy that's used, or gemcitabine and cisplatin, um, both of which are cisplatinum-based, uh, followed by radical cystectomy and a node dissection. So these are what we call the National Comprehensive Cancer Gu Network Guidelines. So these help uh, provide guideline evidence for how we treat and promote um, uh, bladder cancer. And again, we can see here, uh, this is where that patient was with uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy and the recommendations and the level one evidence suggests uh, that giving chemotherapy before surgery is, um, uh, is recommended if you can. There's going to be some caveats, but uh, we may address those later. So for muscle invasive bladder cancer, radical cystectomy, removal of the bladder and uh, possibly the surrounding organs for the, in men, the prostate and females, uh, 
uh, also possibly including the anti-vagina uterus, but we'll get to that, um, is really the gold standard of the most recommended treatment. Um, and also in the States, we do have, uh, you know, robotic options, but having an open or robotic assisted, um, you know, the studies have shown that there's no real difference in terms of the outcomes, uh, or especially the cancer-related outcomes between the two different modalities. Uh, this is really the, uh, the clinical study um, uh, in terms of looking at the natural history of bladder cancer and how it progresses and what the survival curves are. Um, and what we can see here at uh, the five-year survival uh, for organ-confined disease, so again, this is muscle invasive where it's only involving it, is about 90%, and even at 10 years, it's about 90%. Uh, for extravesical disease, we're looking at maybe a 60% 10-year survival, and any nodal positivity is about maybe a 40%. Um, Oh, sorry, uh, in terms of the uh, recurrence rate. And we look at the survival rate here, organ confined at five years is gonna be at about 80 to 90%. For extra vesicle disease, it's gonna be about 50%. And for uh, the nodal metastasis, it's gonna be about 30% uh, here for five year survival rates. So the, the previous one, the A1 is for about uh, the chance of recurrence. Uh, Ah, yes. So Joe asked me a, a very uh, a very good question. So concerning the urothelial carcinoma differential and variants such as squamous differential or micropapillary, do you consider them when prognosticating the outcome? And the answer is yes, 100%. Any of those variant histologies that you may see, micropapillary disease especially being one of them, um, uh, or plasma cytoid as well. We do consider that to be extremely important in terms of our risk prognostication. We do know that those tend to have, uh, you know, higher risks of recurrence, higher risks of progression, higher risk of occult metastasis. Uh, and so we do have to be careful with them. How patients and how uh, physicians and urologists uh, treat them, whether or not they give uh, chemotherapy um, uh, pre-operatively uh, or not can differ from site to site, but usually there is at least a strong recommendation to consider it, um, that as long as there's a urothelial component for this or a urothelial base uh, for the histology, um, that they would have uh, evidence of responding to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, but you're 100% right in that we do consider um, uh, those uh, variant histologies in terms of our risk prognostication. So, for example, uh, for example, if they had, you know, if the patient has had recurrent high-grade T1 or non-muscle invasive disease, and they have these variants, then we may consider our early or timely cystectomy a little bit more uh, earlier, depending on how that goes and how that looks. Okay, um, an excellent question. So, you know, the, the, the theory uh, behind integrated therapy of combining uh, chemotherapy with surgery is really that the recurrence rate following cystectomy is pretty common for urothelial. Um, and uh, there is often um, occult disease, meaning a disease or that is uh, lymph node involvement that we did not realize at the time of imaging. Um, so the risk of clinical understaging is quite significant. The last one being that the majority of recurrences, if they do recur after cystectomy by itself, are you tend to be distant disease. So usually for this integrated or combined therapy, you do want something systemic in addition to the definitive local therapy. And so one thing to note too, um, yeah. So for muscle invasive bladder cancer, again, urothelial carcinoma is chemosensitive, whereas squamous cell carcinoma, it is not chemosensitive. So we have to be uh, quite careful about that uh, in that distinction. And, um, you know, again, the, cert the, the treatment uh, options for squamous cell carcinoma tend to focus a lot more on the local control and local um, definitive therapy. Um, uh, the response rates, even in the metastatic setting, are about 50 to 70 percent for cisplatinum-based regimens. So cisplatinum-based regimens tend to be the primary option um, for what is considered for uh, even the metastatic urothelial carcinoma. Uh, 
However, the survival is still quite, um, you know, uh, quite, quite, quite dim in that the long, more than five year survival for patients with metastatic urethelial carcinoma is really only about 10 to 15 percent. So for chemotherapy, I'm going to kind of briefly run through this. I, I don't know if I want to go into too much details on this, um, uh, unless you would like to. So please let me know if you would like me to go into more detail with this. But again, the, the, the long story short is the chemotherapy can be given in the neoadjuvant setting, meaning before the cystectomy or afterwards. However, it seems that the evidence tends to favor the neoadjuvant setting or the preoperative setting. Um, and again, the cisplatinum-based therapy is not single agent, it's not given by itself, but it is given uh, in combination, usually with gemcitabine and cisplatinum, or as a dose-dense uh, treatment strategy for methotrexate, then blasting doxorubicin and cisplatin, meaning uh, a dose-dense enzyme. Um, so the advantages of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So it's treatment of possible micrometastatic disease without delays in treatment. Um, that's going to be a big uh, area of consideration for us, especially considering that um, the occult metastasis rate for uh, even non-muscle invasive disease, uh, non-muscle invasive, but also specifically for muscle invasive is quite high. Um, and you can uh, really reliably assess the tumor response in vivo, um, you know, with different scans. And you can then therefore change the chemotherapy regimens if you do not see a response. Um, the pa patient's performance uh, status is more optimal, uh, whereas post-surgery, there uh, is, again, a, a pretty significant de uh, decrease in their um, strength and uh, performance status. Uh, and again, the drug delivery is not compromised but by post-surgical changes. Mostly, uh, you know, again, remember that uh, cisplatinum, you do need a very good renal function. You want to make sure that that is maintained and not compromised. The disadvantages of neoadjuvant chemotherapy is that you will over-treat some patients um, and it may delay definitive local therapy. Uh, but again, the um, uh, mortality and morbidity is from the chemotherapy itself. Um, in general, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is really underutilized, even in the state. So most of the uh, population-based studies, meaning our larger studies, really show that only about 12 to 25 percent of eligible patients, even from larger academic centers, uh, actually do receive the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, even though it is the gold standard recommended treatment. Um, I'm going to skip most of this because this goes into the trials uh, for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and then for adjuvant chemotherapy, where you're giving the chemotherapy after um, the, the definitive therapy, the advantage of that is that you can do the therapy based off of pathologic staging, so it's much more accurate. Um, and you can treat the micrometastasis when the volume is the lowest because we already debulked everything. However, you know, again, this is a pretty morbid procedure, so it's pretty poorly tolerated in a post-operative setting. You have to be careful for that and, you know, adjust for that. Um, since time is running a little bit lower, I wanted to just go briefly over some of the radical cystectomy techniques. Um, and then go, you know, open it, open it up for a kind of more open discussion. Um, so Kama Ludin, uh, so forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, Osman uh, asked me a very good question. Is there any association between tumor location and recurrence? So very good question. And the answer is it kind of depends. Um, you know, the, the risk fat or the independent risk factors for uh, recurrence risk tend to be more related to the size uh, of it. So larger ones, if they're multifocal, um, if they have any adverse features, for example, variant histologies or um, uh, LVI, lymphovascular invasion, um, those tend to have the kind of more independent associations with uh, recurrence rate. Um, the location, it's, so this is where it gets tricky because if there is hydronephrosis, that is an independent fact, risk factor for 
uh, cancer outcomes regarding recurrence and survival risk. But it's a little bit tricky because it's not, it may not be related to the biology of it, but in fact, it's just an indication of uh, that disease being so invasive and infiltrative that's causing uterine obstruction. Um, so that's where, you know, your, your question is a very good one, but it's, a, it's, it's not the most straightforward answer. Um, I would argue that the, the location itself is not independently associated with it, except uh, in areas where it may be related to how um, uh, aggressive or infiltrative it is, for example, if it causes hydronephrosis. Um, so for the, you know, radical cystectomy, um, I, I, I'll go briefly over what we kind of do for our open cystectomies, where we use kind of a lower midline incision. Some of us stop below the umbilicus, some of us go all the way up, especially for a more extensive lymph node dissection. And again, we'll divide the uracus, hold the bladder up. And again, one, one of the first things that we do is kind of open up the peritoneum, um, reflect the colon and the bowel so that we have very good access to the retroperitoneum. And then the first thing that we'll do is, you know, isolate the, uh, the ureter if we can. And that's uh, how kind of the diagram looks with everything retracted. Uh, and then as we go along, we'll uh, take down the ureter. Um, and w w one thing to note too that uh, we often do in order to maximize how much ureteral length, uh, you know, in America, the majority of our patients are quite obese. So in order to uh, make sure that we have adequate length, we wanna make sure that we have good ureteral length for it. So in fact, a lot of times I'll take the superior vesicle artery and ligate that first before dissecting out the ureter so that I can maximize that length. And by doing that, it usually buys me at least a couple of centimeters in ureteral length. Um, so again, this is kind of how things look with the ureter spatulated there. Um, you know, this is kind of a, a view just from the top all the way down where you can see uh, the the, the pedicles, and usually again, we'll go for those lateral and posterior pedicles and clip them and divide. Um, the, again, remember the vasculature that we work with is the superior vesicle and inferior vesicle artery. Um, so those are uh, two of the arteries or pedicles that we will be you know, looking for and keeping track of. Uh, and forgive me if I'm going a little bit fast with this, but I just wanna make sure that I cover things in time because I know uh, that all of you are quite busy um, and I believe it is probably close to seven o'clock in the evening there. So you have families to get back to. Um, but again, from the posterior dissection over, um, one thing that we do, uh, can do for younger men or younger women with um, uh, 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 lower risk muscle invasive bladder cancer is the nerve sparing, especially if we're gonna consider doing a neobladder or a studer neobladder for them. Um, and cystectomy in a woman, again, usually it's a, a, a full exenteration that we would do. Uh, we would take the uterus, the ovaries, um, and the anterior portion of the vagina. Um, and again, we, we see here ligation of the ovarian vessels, uh, again, dissection of the ureter up front, uh, where we'll in fact take that whole anterior vagina up. One thing that we have been doing a lot more of is doing um, a, uh, and so, so that's what the exenteration looks like afterwards where we'll have that posterior plate of the vagina and then flap that upwards. Um, uh, especially for our younger patients to offer a vaginal sparing uh, cystectomy uh, where, you know, depending on if they've had a hysterectomy or not, we can do that. Um, and leave the vagina in place so that, uh, you know, it, it um, you know, for uh, intercourse quality of life and, um, you know, uh, also in discussions of prolapse, prolapse is definitely one of those things that we do worry about in women after an anterior exenteration. Uh, the pelvic lymph node dissection, and again, I'll go pretty quickly with this, but usually we do recommend an extended lymph node dissection. Uh, for something like this uh, as both a diagnostic and, uh, you know, treatment effect. And usually we'll go take the obturator packets all the way up to the common iliac. Um, we'll go through the bifurcation. Um, and we'll clear out everything over the iliac, the obturator fossa, and also the, uh, the, the iliac arteries. 
Um, and that's just showing uh, the kind of dissection there. And the one thing I did want to show you afterwards too is what our standard lymph node dissection will look like afterwards, where again, you're going through bifurcation with the common iliacs uh, skeletonized, uh, going over with the obturator nerve and everything you can see there. And you can see again, the external and the hypogastric there are very well skeletonized in that area. This guy was quite thin. Um, so he's not your standard uh, American patient. Um, and then briefly, just going over the urinary diversion rate, again, we, we do face some pretty high complication rates. And some common themes for how we divert you know, the urine uh, will be the, 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 the problems with metabolic acidosis, bone loss, and hydronephrosis and obstruction that you have to worry about. Um, I do understand that, um, you know, depending on uh, where you are, how you're located, the utilization and the type of diversion that you use can vary pretty significantly. In the States, we do use a lot of small bowel diversions, um, so including um, uh, the ileal conduit um, and also our studer neobladders uh, or Hartman, uh, um, 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 what do you call it? Uh, Hartman um, tend to be, uh, or are with small bowel, uh, whereas our Indiana pouches or the continent uh, cutaneous diversions tend to be with large bowels, say with the you know, ascending colon. But I do understand that, um, especially in areas that may not have stoma devices or bags available or where the care is uh, not optimal, that, for example, using a mains 2 diversion um, may be the best option in order to keep the patient's quality of life going and still keep them somewhat continent. Um, uh, so those are different things that, you know, again, we, we'd have to learn from each other on that. But for the ileal conduit, this is probably one of the more common uh, uh, urinary diversions used, but you do get some metabolic acidosis. You can get some bone demineralization that you see you, you have from there. And again, in our obese patients, we do worry about uh, some peristoma hernias. And usually what we'll do is again, go from about 15 centimeters from the terminal ileum and take a 15 centimeter loop. Uh, we'll look for that avascular plane, the, the plane of treves, uh, uh, between uh, the branch of the iliac, uh, uh, the ileal artery. We'll, uh, we'll ligate the, the vessels going through. Uh, again, in the States, we'll use uh, stapled anastomoses, but again, this is something you can do a hand-sewn anastomosis for with excellent results. Um, and we'll do the ileal to ileal anastomosis, usually as a side-to-side -side anastomosis. And for the ureters, uh, the ureter to bowel anastomosis, you want to make sure that you do spatulate them and that you're very careful with the ureter. Um, the, the ureteral ileal uh, stricture rates can be as high as up to five to 7%. Um, and some, some studies even suggest higher. So you want to be fairly careful with them and try to make sure that you maximize blood supply and collateral blood flow while minimizing any damage, traction, injury, or uh, any cardiac effect to the uh, anastomosis. You also want to make sure that, you know, again, you know, standard surgical techniques that you um, do a mucosal to mucosal anastomosis, that you do attention free, but also that you uh, have it be uh, water tight so you avoid any leakage. Um, and that, um, uh, you know, spatulating the ureter to provide some more surface area is one of those effective ways to do that. Um, so again, for most of these, I'll go through, and then again, this is the formation of the stoma, which will handle in a routine fashion um, um, uh, to, uh, to um, implicate it. Um, and this is again our Indiana pouch that uh, I won't go through too much, but I'll go through our neobladder here. Um, we have to be careful because it does have high complications rate with about 30% being incontinent, 30% requiring catheterization. Um, it'll be a longer segment of small bowel, about 60 centimeters uh, in general. Um, and basically what we do is we spatulate it on on the antimnesenteric side and then we sew it together uh, in kind of this almost U-shaped fashion there. And we'll do the anastomosis 
Um, so, you know, I, I apologize if I went a little bit quickly through some of uh, those uh, techniques, but I wanted to make sure that we leave enough time for discussion afterwards. Uh, but again, just to summarize everything, urothelial carcinoma of the bladder is not common, but it is increasing specifically in Uganda and East Africa. For squamous cell carcinoma, it is more common and often presents as a late disease. Uh, for non-invasive bladder cancer, um, you know, we do recommend high quality and repeat transurethral resections of the bladder tumor. Um, and uh, I do recommend intravesical therapy. If BCG is not available, then gemcitabine is a really excellent uh, tool. So I would definitely reach out to the medical oncology colleagues to use some of that chemotherapy and put it into the bladder itself. Uh, and then muscle invasive disease, we talked that neoadjuvant chemotherapy is really recommended in level one evidence. Um, and we talked briefly about the cystectomy techniques and also some of the urinary diversion techniques uh, briefly. Um, so if I could, I'll leave it there um, for any questions or discussions. Um, so if, if any of you have any discussions or, or questions that I could help address, uh, please, uh, you can either use the chat or uh, you can ask them directly over this, uh, the, the Zoom thing. Okay, so Henry Kiemba asked, uh, if uh, should one plan to have intravesical BCG on the ready while planning to do TRBT? So this is where things are a little bit different. Great question. Um, BCG, you want to be very careful with. You do not want to give BCG directly after a TRBT. Um, the chemotherapy is really the mitomycin C or the gemcitabine. Um, and so with those, you do want to have those available that you can give them within 24 hours of the TURBT. It's quite simple to give. Um, and in fact, I can give the doses and they explain them in the papers. Usually it'll be a 50 milligram dose within a, you know, um, a 40 milliliter normal saline solution that you can then put into the bladder um, or 50 cc solution. You leave it there for about one or two hours and then you have, um, you, you, you drain it out and you dump it into your chemotherapy waste. Um, the BCG, you do not want to give until about four to six weeks after the TURBT. You wanna make sure that the bladder is totally healed after the TURBT before you introduce BCG. And the reason why is, again, if there's any sign or, or risk of perforation, uh, that that can, uh, BCG can leak out and cause pretty significant harm. For example, BCG sepsis is a possibility. Oh, that's very interesting. So Job, you were saying that uh, you have been seen as squamous carcinoma, but are admitting urothelial carcinoma every week. That is quite fascinating. Um, do you think that it's related to smoking changes in smoking habits, or it, it seems that like Uganda is actually pretty good in terms of not everybody is smoking. Like I know in, for example, all the Asian countries, Korea, Vietnam, smoking is really bad. But um, do you think you have a, a reason for uh, the urothelial carcinoma or is just more people are just coming with that? Mm. Yes, no, so I, 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 I think that is definitely, so Joe was saying that that is a, you know, um, a research question. Um, and I 100% agree. I do think that uh, it would be a very interesting to, to study that. 
Okay, um, any, any other questions I could help answer? Uh, yes, Josephine. Uh, after how long would you recommend repeat TURBT for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer? Excellent question. Usually you want to do it within a, uh, within a month. I would normally say somewhere between, um, you, you want the bladder to heal up a little bit. Uh, so anywhere from say two to four weeks um, is, is a reasonable time. Even six weeks is okay, depending on how extensive it is. Um, so any, any time between there. Interesting. So uh, somebody texting from 189018 saying that uh, the, you are seeing a lot of young patients now. Ah, okay. So Fred, thank you for clearing, uh, clarifying that for me. Uh, so Fred was mentioning that the, the schistosomiasis, the hematobium is not as common as the Mansoni in Uganda. Uh, so that's very interesting, and I'm pretty sure then that everybody who shares a border with Lake Victoria is going to have some pretty similar um, uh, similar characteristics then. Ah. So, so Joe was asking for T1 tumor, is the radical cystectomy upfront better than neoadjuvant? Uh, so this is where um, uh, there will be some differences. So for T1, I would really recommend um, the BCG therapy upfront first before you try a cystectomy at least, uh, because we know that BCG, when it's given, will uh, significantly decrease the risk of recurrence and progression to invasive disease. Um, because cystectomy um, upfront is uh, quite um, aggressive and morbid, uh, we usually reserve those if they have invasive disease or T2, where it's invasive into the muscularis propria. If it does involve the muscularis propria though, and it's uh, then muscle invasive bladder cancer, then I would recommend neoadjuvant upfront versus uh, two cystectomy but they have to be fair, 